Hello, welcome to the, uh, the third lecture in our series on mathematical modeling of football. So today we're going to look at simulating matches. And in particular, we're going to look at what I think is, you can say is like the most important mathematical idea behind football. And that's the Poisson distribution. And um, we've looked last week, we looked a lot at expected goals. And that's the thing you maybe read about the most as a sort of statistics applied to football. But I think what we're going to cover today, the Poisson distribution is sort of more fundamental. If you like to think of the idea of mathematics underlying things, I think the Poisson distribution is the basic thing that underlies football. Um, and you might not be familiar with the Poisson distribution. I'm definitely going to explain a lot about what it is today. But what it's related to is the memorylessness of football. Often when people talk about football, they, they talk about sort of the, the build up of the game, how the game progressed over time and so on, and the sort of feelings and things that happened, which, which sort of led to the, the, the picture of the match. That's valuable. But when you actually look at football from a mathematical perspective, perspective, you find that it really doesn't have that much memory. The goals can occur at any time during a football match, and they pretty much come at random. They come at random at different rates for different teams, which are better and worse than others, but they pretty much come at random um, throughout the match. There's a few kind of caveats about that, but that becomes our basic mathematical principle whenever we're, we're modeling anything to do with football. It's the principle that we'll use today for simulating teams and, and matches, but it's also a principle that we'll use later when it comes to simulating match situations. The whole idea is that you can't see too far into the future in a football match, and that might seem that it makes it sort of random and difficult to predict, but actually the fact that we can't see too far in, into the future makes it more amenable to mathematics rather than less amenable to mathematics. Okay, I've said uh, started off with a few abstract things. I'm gonna make it more concrete um, as we go on about how we're going to use the Poisson distribution. I'll get my screen shared here and I need to click that. Yeah. So what's the structure today? Well, we're going to look at randomness in football. I've already said a little bit about why football is random. This is a hard, it's a hard concept to, it's a difficult thing for me to say that football is random. Um, I often say that uh, when I did a lot of interviews around soccer-matics, people ask me how random is football? And, and I, I, can, I think as a rough rule of thumb, which you can relate to, two thirds of random of football is randomness. If you think that there's typically about three goals in a football match, one goal goes to the better team and the two goals are basically randomly shared between the, um, the better team who might win three nil or the other team that might win two one. So that's a good way of roughly imagining for a Premier League match, for example, how the outcome might be, might be described. And the one goal is non-random the two goals are random. So it's about two thirds randoms. I know that in the numbers game, they came up with a half of a football match is random. And there's various studies showing, showing that kind of thing. I don't think you can put an exact number on it, but let's be sure there's lots and lots of randomness in the outcome of football matches, not necessarily in what the players are doing. And that randomness that leads us to the Poisson model, which is a great um, description of um, when a small number of random events occur. And there's definitely, we know there's a small number of goals in football. And then once we have the Poisson model, we're going to then use that to try and find signals for good football. Quite a few questions came up in the, in the first, particularly in the first lecture about, you know, I was, I was creating different heat maps and different descriptions of, for example, press, um, defensive actions of passing and so on. But what I didn't try in those lectures was to say, well, this thing's good and this thing's bad. And that's because it's really, really difficult to say what's good football and what's bad football. But if there's one way we're going to tease it apart, the Poisson model is the way that we're going to do it. Then I'm going to do a bit of a code walkthrough. I've put up, I haven't put the link in the YouTube, but if you go into the course webpage, I've put up the link to the new code on the GitHub. 
um, which you can definitely sit there and run in parallel to when I'm waffling on. Um, and I've also put the lecture notes for today's lectures. I put a couple more things in since I put them up, but most of most of the lecture notes for today's lectures are up on the course web page. Um, if anyone's wondering where that is, maybe someone who, who knows it can share it in the chat. I, I've checked that we can have access. So I, I think you should be able to get into both those things. Code on GitHub, the um, lecture notes, if you want to have them in parallel, maybe skip ahead and if you're getting bored of me talking, skip ahead and see what's coming next in the slides. You can do that as well. I'll have a break 11 to 11.15. Please ask questions in the chat where possible. I will try and remember to break off and answer them on the way. I always say this, I'll take a reasonably slow pace, then I get carried away and start taking a, a higher pace. But I'll try and um, take a reasonably slow pace and interact with you along the way. Okay, so when are shots taken in a football match? This is one figure. Now I've actually forgotten which league it was. I think, um, is it the same as that one? Yeah, it is the same as that one. So it's the Premier League. This is the second half of the Premier League. And this is when, um, I've, what I've done is I've taken stats from, I've taken the Y scout data and I've basically put it into boxes from minute zero up to minute 48 in Premier League matches for the second half. And I've measured how many shots occur within those minutes. And the main takeaway message here is if you look at this line, this is the average number of shots throughout the whole match. I've, I've cheated a little bit here. I haven't actually measured the length of all the matches. I've assumed the matches are on average 48 minutes long. If you really want to do this properly, you might want to, to make an adjustment for that. But this is the average number of shots per minute through, um, oh, sorry, the total number of shots per minute that occurred in all of those matches. The average, of course, needs to be divided by the number of matches. And what you see is just sort of, for the main part, you just see a kind of fluctuation around this average. It isn't that there's one minute where all of the action happens. Maybe you can say that in the first minute of the match, uh, in fact, you can say in the first, first minute of the second half, there's less likely to be shots. Second minute, maybe. But then after that, really up to the final whistle, there's equally likely to be shots in, in a football match. Now, I think that this is quite surprising um, when you haven't seen this statistic before, because we do tend to think, and I even think when I'm, I'm watching a match that, well, there's going to be some sort of exciting chance. I have this friend who always talks about like the last big chance. And when we watch football together, he's sitting there waiting, anticipating what he believes is the last big chance that every team always has. And he always says that this will happen in the last three or four minutes. Then when he's happy, <laughs> if it's his team who's, who's, um, who's losing and they need to have this last big chance, when he imagines that this big chance has occurred, maybe in the 46th minute, after that, he gives up all hope. But when you actually look at the stats, there really doesn't exist this last big chance. There is throughout the match, a relatively even number of, um, of shots, apart from maybe in the, in the first minute. Then you can also look at that for the first half and the second half. I was actually quite surprised because I've done this before and I haven't found this relationship, but I found that there does seem to be a slight difference between the first half and the second half. There are less shots in the first half than there are in the second half. And that might be, that's, Think, I think due to two reasons. One is that the matches start slowly. So in exactly this area here, we have, um, I'm gonna put this laser pointer on. In this area here, we have uh, um, less shots. So when the match starts, the teams come out a bit, um, a bit slower. And then I think there tends to be more extra time in the second half um, than in the first half. So that's another part of the explanation. But the difference is reasonably small. In the first half, there's around about the same shots as there is in the second half. I think if you were a coach and you were trying to exploit something about this figure, this is what you would think to, this is what you should be thinking to exploit. Because here it seems that there is some chance of getting more shots up 
there is no reason apart from the ball starts in the middle of the pitch but it does that for a lot of lot of the game there's no reason that you can't start to have shots certainly by the second minute in the game um so but the, the overall thing i want to emphasize is that you have this you can take the first and second half separately but you have this reasonably um it's a normal distribution of the number of shots that you have per minute and it's pretty constant throughout the match and then when we look at goals we actually find something similar there are more goals in the first in the, in this particular data set there were more goals in the second half than there were in the first half but during they come pretty much any time during a particular half there's of course fluctuations here and the fluctuations are bigger because the number of events is smaller but there isn't really a clear pattern where there's an increase in number of goals coming as the match goes on and neither is in the first half there's an increase in the number of goals again maybe the first or second minute there's some pattern but otherwise foot, goals can come pretty much any time during a football match again i want to emphasize that if you're possibly if you're working in betting and you want to find a small small edge to exploit about this pattern then there might be something for you for, to find there but for nearly all other purposes of modeling football it's the best assumption is to say that we um the goals come at any time during a football match because that's just going to make everything to do with our modeling so much more um so much easier as a premier league season i did i did some i did some um uh other things with it, I did the Bundesliga and La Liga and got similar patterns um, to this one. The code's in there. We'll have a little look at it later. Okay, so I like to make this figure because I think it, it brings home um, the point. So if you divide the match into, let's say, 100 boxes, this is a 100-minute match, a bit longer than we might expect, but imagine you have a 100-minute match. And you say that one box is equal to one minute. What you're essentially doing is you're saying that goals occur more or less randomly during a match. And typically, a team scores 1.35 um, goals, just less than one and a half goals per match. And you can think about the way you think about this as a model is you basically think about just throwing these balls these random goals down at random inside the boxes. And sometimes you throw, um, sometimes you throw for a team, sometimes you throw one ball, sometimes you throw two balls, sometimes you throw three balls, but you'll basically throw these balls down randomly in the time slots, a bit like the time slots I had in the histogram. So you might have two goals coming in into the match at random points. You might have one goal that you've dropped in at random. You might have two goals over here and that's the basic idea of our model we're dropping goals randomly into boxes and then we can actually from there we can actually build a mathematical description of football i was asked for a documentary i was asked to do this i was asked to like look at what are the chances of buying conceding two goals in injury time in 1999 in this in this famous match against manchester united um is I took a couple of statements from the commentators. I rewatched this match and looked and listened to a couple of statements from the um, uh, commentators. I really like this one. I tell you what, if they could equalize, and I'm not betting against them, I think they'll go on to win it, which I think actually goes against exactly what I've just said. You don't expect if a team does get that random goal, there's no reason actually to believe more strongly that they'll get the next random goal, um, other than that they might be a slightly stronger team. Um, and of course, it ends with nobody will ever win the European Cup final more dramatically than this because Manchester United scored two goals in injury time. Um, I'm going to say that they were with, uh, within one minute. They were maybe within one minute of, of, um, of playing time, but they were actually within two minutes of each other. But for the sake of argument, we'll say that they were within one box of my uh, model. And so basically, you can see the match like this. So this Champions League final, you can see the match as sort of a load of empty things. And then suddenly, pop, pop, two goals just occurred in the same box in the same minute of this match. And, and of course, this is very unlikely 
that they occur both in this in this um, way. But also we watch a lot of football matches. We lo watch a lot of football matches where different things happen. And now and again, things like this will happen. So the fact that you get these two goals at the end of a Champions League final, it doesn't completely dismiss the idea that the goals occur at random. It just happened that in that particular match, it was bop bop, both of the goals happened in this 99th minute. Again, I think I need to emphasize this over and over again because it's a sort of fundamental thing about mathematical modeling. This is our assumption. It's not that I definitely believe that uh, Manchester United only won the Champions League final because of randomness. It's just that it becomes a reasonable assumption and very little that we um, observe in football contradicts that assumption. So for most cases, and even the Champions League final doesn't necessarily contradict that assumption. You can, of course, go in the other extreme. I did this because I thought it was fun. The both the goals occur in the same minute or within a minute of playing time of each other. But the probability of that is one in 100 um, because I've got 100 boxes that they, they occur. And if they both occur at the same time, there's a one in 100 chance of that. Um, and then that both occur in the second last minute. Well, that's a one in a 10,000 chance because you then specify specifically which minute you want to have. You can actually go a little bit further and you can say, well, what if they both, they actually both came from a corner and then you start to get down to like, this is a problem, a one in a million chance. So this is a kind of opposite way of seeing it than I've just described where we see it as random. We actually see what happened and then we calculate the probability of that particular thing happening. I think I want to emphasize this is a just for fun calculation using probability. This, which we've looked at here, is the more serious model of how randomness can fool us in a way or, or how we, we can control randomness. We see football matches as balls falling into boxes and then we can actually manage to build up a model of those things. Um, so yeah, one in a million that they chose. That if you'd asked me before the match, um, to calculate the probability that Manchester United would win uh, with two corners within a minute or two of each other, I would have probably come up with one in a million. But given the amount of the football that's played and the different things that can happen, all, all of those, um, these, these different things happen. And I suppose it's the same with the Champions League, with um, the, the Liverpool. Liverpool come back from three goals down. Liverpool get three goals in the second half. A very unlikely event, but consistent with the idea that goals occur randomly at foot in football. So often when we have these very strong stories about what happened in a football match, they often don't lie so far away from the randomness that we expect to occur in football matches. Fun calculation. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I put, I put that on there to uh it's, it's a calculation based on if you ask me before the match but of course after the match um this thing did happen so it's no longer a one in a million chance it actually happened so the chance was 100 percent. but there is serious maths behind it oh yes that um we have this we we break things down into boxes and we we're going to put these these balls down and here is the serious maths then so what's the probability of k goals um, occurring in a football match. Now, before I was looking at one team and I said there was 1.35 goals, this, this number 2.7, some leagues it's 2.5, some leagues it's 2.8. Uh, it varies a bit, but I think in one Premier League that I was looking at, there was 2.7 goals scored in a match. And I'm going to assign them randomly between 95 minutes, which might be typical for a football match. I, I haven't looked at Neither of these numbers are absolutely um, cast in iron, but they're roughly what we see in typical football matches. Okay, so what is the probability of goals? Well, the way we work it out, and it's related to the box model, we drop, um, we see in each of these boxes, what's the probability that it's filled with a ball? So the probability that a particular box is filled with a ball is 2.7 divided by 95. So in this particular case, I've got 95 boxes, not the 100 I have here. And I say that each of them can be filled with a ball with 2.7. And this is this probability. So out of here, we're going to fill K of the boxes with a ball. And that's 2.7 divided by 95. 
is the probability that any one box is filled with a ball and the probability that k boxes is filled with a ball is where you just multiply all of those together. But we also have to account for the boxes which aren't filled with balls. And that's one minus 2.7 divided by 95. So this is a probability that a particular box is empty. You see the probability a box is empty is bigger, of course, than the probability it's, it's occupied. And this one minus 2.7 over 95, well, that's going to be some reasonably large number, this number. This number is about one in one in 30, something around this. So this is um, 29 over 30. And that's to the power of 95 minus K because 95 minutes, and then we take minus K as the ones that are filled with the box. Then the last term we have to take, this is the combinatorical. So this is, um, this is 95 um, factorial divided by K factorial times 95 minus um, K factorial. I should have written this out, but these are, these are, this is the factorial. Um, this, what do you call it? This is the choose function, 95 choose K, which just to say it again, 95 factorial divided by K factorial um, times 95 minus K factorial. And that um, then says, well, we have to choose each of these. So these, when I've dropped all of these, these balls into the boxes, I have to actually choose these things at random. And this is the binomial distribution, which is very typical or is used to describe exactly this type of problem. You'll have seen it used, for example, um, yeah, well, you'll see, I'm not going to try another example. This, this, is used, this is used for this type of problem of dropping, dropping balls in randomly. Okay, so I, I've, I've, I've had 95, I had 100 boxes here and I had 95 boxes here, I decided on. Here's the question. So why have I divided the match into minutes? What's special about minutes? I could like use two minutes. I could use 30 seconds, I could use one second, I could use 10 seconds. Why do I make my boxes minutes? And there is actually no good reason to make my boxes minutes other than it's something that we understand very well. Um, but we can actually think a little bit more about this question. And the question really here is, and I'm not gonna give you a complete answer here, is how many seconds into the future can we predict a future match, a, a football match. Can we predict it one minute into the future? Can we predict it 10 seconds into the future? Can we predict it one second into the future? And that's basically the question of, can you predict um, when a goal will occur in this case? Because it's, it's not just predicting anything about the football match, it's predicting that a goal will occur within one minute time frame, frame into the future. Now, if you can, if you happen to believe that you can predict a football match more than one minute into the future, you can actually become extremely rich because you've got time to place a bet on who's going to next score and you'll become very, very rich because you'll be able to predict this. If you've got some sort of method of doing it and that method is better than the bookmaker's method, which is based on the Poisson model I'm going to talk about, then you can get extremely rich. 10 seconds into the future, possible in some situations. It's possible when there's a penalty, for example, then you can make better predictions that there'll be a goal um, in the near future if a penalty's just been awarded. But outside there being a penalty, it's pretty difficult actually to predict even 10 seconds into the future. One second into the future, I can kind of believe that um, it's possible to predict what's going to happen in a match. You've got a one-on-one -on -one situation. You can certainly get a much better than random estimate of if there's going to be a goal or not. But basically this number here uh, determines the number of boxes. So it should be somewhere, I think, between one minute and one second. So um, to get the number of boxes, you divide 90 or 95 or 100 or how many minutes you've assumed in your football match, you divide it by um, the, the time scale that you believe you can predict into the future. And I think that that's somewhere between one second and one minute. And that tells us, well, um, yeah, so I've said here 2.7 goals scored per match were randomly distributed by between 95 minutes. 
But then we can rewrite this equation. We rewrite this equation by saying, well, whatever boxes you come up with here, if you think it's 10 seconds boxes, then it's 95 um, multiplied by six boxes that you should have. If you think that you really can't do it even on one second, then it's 95 times 60 boxes that you have. But we have these N boxes where 2.7 goals are scored per match randomly distributed between the N boxes. Again, we use the choose function here, N choose K. This is the probability that a goal occurs in a particular map box. This is the probability that a goal doesn't occur in a particular box. We multiply these two together in the binomial distribution. And then we can do quite a nice thing. So we there's a nice mathematical result that tells us this, this, this is sort of complicated to calculate this binomial um, distribution. There's, from a mathematical point, it's kind of unsatisfying that we have this massive n factorial thing here. And there's several reasons we don't want to use it because just because lots of mathematical machinery is not built up for dealing with these types of discrete, um, discrete distributions. But we can do the following thing. I'm going to go through this step by step, and you can have a look at this later. Um, I've stolen this from a, a Math Caltech lecture, um, saved myself writing this out myself, but it's a very nice derivation of what's called Poisson's limit, or it's also called the law of small numbers, which goes from the Poisson, from the binomial distribution here. This is exactly what we saw on the last page. And it goes to the Poisson distribution, which is shown here. And what we do is we take the, we take and start with the um, binomial distribution. This is where we expand it out in terms of the, um, this is what I should have done to make it clear. This is n factorial divided by n minus k factorial gives n multiplied all the way down to n minus k plus one. Then we divide by k factorial here. We have the mean, the mean mu here, which is 2.7 in our case. N is our number of boxes. But again, this is just the same form. So this is just a simplification here. Then what we can do is we can take this n to the power of k and we can divide through all of these terms by n. We've got a k factorial on the bottom. We've got mu to the power of k and we've got this thing over here, one minus mu over n, that's just a, to the power of n minus k. That's the same thing as we had before. Um, simplify this thing again, or not necessarily simplify it, but turn it into, a, into something that we'll be able to deal with when we take a limit. So we're going to take a limit as we get n smaller and smaller, um, sorry, n bigger and bigger, because n bigger and bigger corresponds to more and more boxes. So more and more randomness in football. And we do this one minus one over n because what, what's going to be really nice here is that as the n goes to infinity, this will disappear. n goes to infinity, this will disappear. n goes to infinity, this will disappear. And we've got this k factorial under. Um, we've also, we've left this because we also know what's going to, oh, this because we also know what's going to happen when n goes to infinity. And then we do this, we put n goes to infinity in all of these. So we allow n to go to infinity. That's the number of boxes going to infinity. This corresponds to less and less predictableness in football. Now, of course, this isn't exactly true because I admitted that in on a one second interval, we can start to actually make predictions in football, but it's nearly true to the, the end you've got to, you get to, for example, 60 times 95 is pretty big. So in practice, this thing is going to work. When we let in go to infinity, all of these terms become one, this term becomes one, this term becomes one, this term becomes one, I have a one here. K factorial is not uh, affected by n going to infinity. Mu to the K is not affected by n, go n going to infinity. This thing here, well, you've got mu divided by n, n goes to infinity, so this thing just um, goes to one. And then this last part here, this is probably the, um, uh, the harder, harder one to work through, but actually this is by definition, the limit of this is e to the minus mu, as you have one minus mu divided by n to the power of n. So you get e to the minus mu. And so finally, you're left with Poisson's distribution, which um, gives you the, yeah, gives you the probability that gives you this probability of scoring in terms of your original parameter, mu 2.7, 
k and you'll see that n has disappeared which is very nice so we don't need to think about our boxes anymore provided we can write our football game in terms of enough boxes we get the the limit we want which is a lovely lovely result discovered by poisson many many years ago um, and is also known as the the law of, of small numbers which i think is a, a lovely thing and the and the the small numbers is is the small number of goals in in football. Um, there is a small number of goals in football, and that allows us to make this a derivation of the Poisson distribution. And what does this mean in practice? Well, I told you this equation um, for um, for ninety five minutes. Then I looked at this equation for n, and in practice, this means that this equation, the number of goals in your match, will be described very well by this equation: two point seven to the power of k e to the minus 2.7 divided by k factorial will give you the probability you'll have um, a particular number of goals in the match. This, this is one, this is really a kind of, um, this is a bit geeky actually, or what can I say about this? I actually thought about this a lot that 2.71 is actually very close to the number e. So e is approximated by 2.71 so the fact that you have 2.7 goals in football means you can actually write this equation down, which will work very nicely for a lot of goals in football. And you see that this isn't actually a parameter free equation because E isn't a proper parameter in maths. E is a universal constant. So you can write down the number of goals in football just using universal constants and K, which is the thing that you want to estimate is the number of goals. So E to the K, to e to the minus e divided by k factorial, no parameters whatsoever will give you a fundamental model of football. I think that this, this is, I am joking a bit here, but this is sort of as fundamental as um, gravitational models or quantum theory models. This is the fundamental equation of football where you don't have to, um, you don't have any constants whatsoever in describing uh, the number of goals that occur in a football match. But I, I do want to be clear that that is also because of the coincidence that it happens that 2.7 goals on average are scored during football matches. I think, maybe it's not, I don't know. So, okay, there's been a long derivation, but this is what I think is just incredibly cool about this. It, it means that um, we can get a whole goal distribution um, recovered from the mean number of goals in the match. So we have the mean number of goals in the match, it's 2.7 or it's 2.5 or whatever. And that allows us using this, this equation in particular, it allows us to then plot the entire curve of likely outcomes um, in matches during the, or the outcome of matches during the season. So this is number of matches plotted here and this is number of goals. The black curve here is the Poisson distribution, which gives a reasonably good estimate of the number of goals scored in, scored in different matches. And so we can recover the whole goal distribution from the mean number of goals. This is one, I think actually I might have included the wrong figure there, so I'm just going to check that. But this is one I did from the um, Y Scout data. Um, this is probability, proportion of matches with a particular number of goals. We've got the Poisson curve here. You can do this yourself for the 10 goals per game. We've got the Poisson distribution there. We've got the data here. And it's not a perfect fit, but it's very close to um, how many goals you get. There's one match here which is overestimated. One nil seem to be overestimated in La Liga. We look at Bundesliga, possibly uh, overrepresented one ones here. It's overrepresented one nils here. Than predicted, maybe overrepresented one ones in Bundesliga, for example, more draws than we might expect. You can see nil nil, more draws than we might expect, less one nil results, but pretty much consistent with the with the Poisson model. I think the last thing I want to say before I uh, go over to because what I'm going to do next is like how we're going to use this. One thing I want to do last here before we uh, I go and have a look at your questions and we go into the break is that the Poisson distribution is fundamental to football. If you're interested in basketball um, or a lot of other sports, then it's actually the normal distribution, which is the fundamental distribution. And the reason is this is actually the opposite of the, well, not the opposite of the law of large numbers, but we have the law of small numbers for things that don't occur very much, 
which is goals in football. For things that occur a lot, we have the law of large numbers, and that's where the normal distribution comes in. Normal distribution is what you get if you add up loads and loads of random things. So if you add up loads and loads of random scoring in um, basketball matches, you get a normal distribution. And I made this actually one for my, um, for my latest book. I looked at basketball and found very nicely and regularly for NBA games 2018-19, and I'm sure you can do this for other seasons, you have the normal curve, this bell-shaped curve, very accurately describes the number of points scored per team in each game. And that's because you can see basketball is the sum of lots and lots of random events, while football is the sum of very few random events. Law of large numbers gives you the normal distribution. Law of small numbers gives you the Poisson distribution. Good. What I'll do um, now is I will just stop this and I will go in. If you've got any questions, please, um, please type them into the chat and I'll see if I can um, answer them. Um, Good. So Arne May says, could I argue that the ideal box size is the runtime of an average single possession? That's a good starting point. I think I haven't gone into this, but I did think of one thing to mention is what you would what you would do if you really wanted to find out what is the perfect box size for football. You should use the Lyapunov exponent. The Lyapunov exponent, you can look it up on, on Wikipedia. I, I think I need to. Lyapunov exponent. So to do this, and this is a really lovely project for someone I've never seen this done before, is that you take um, you take possession chains, um, sequences of, of um, possessions, and use the Lyapunov exponent to work out where the ball is in the future. And if you can predict, so the degree to which you can predict where the ball is in the future on some time scale gives you um, this, this constant, it tells you the number of boxes. Um, so that, that's my answer to Arne Mays. Um, L Planet 2009, 2008, does the data really suggest that goals are independent? I guess scoring the first goal influences chances. Yeah, I, I haven't really gone into exactly that. Again, if you're interested in, in betting is um, some way of, of, of uh, doing that. But surprisingly not, that the really the best, you've always got to outcompete the base rate of scoring. So if a team gets a one nil lead against Manchester City, then the commentators will describe it as like Manchester City are really laying on the pressure. They're trying to try and as hard as they can now, blah, blah, blah. Football players always try as hard as they can, or they nearly always try as hard as they can. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Manchester City's base rate of scoring, as we're going to see soon, is incredibly high, so they're very likely to score. So it can happen that the, these sorts of things happen psychologically, but what's surprising actually is how little that type of psychological thing happens compared to the amount of time that people spend talking about it. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, again, Tefo asked the same question um, about, you know, is it nothing, something non-statistical? Um, so one thing that I always emphasize here is that you have to be able to measure it, right? So what do you mean by when you say, is there something mentality of the teams playing? So where do you measure that mentality? So we have a very good model of football, which involves it being random. It works for lots of things. And so unless you're working for the team and you find some way of measuring their mentality, and even if you're working with a team, what exactly are you measuring? After the match, they will say they, they didn't have the right mentality. The players will say, oh, we didn't have the right mentality because we lost. And if they win, they'll say, yeah, it was our mentality that brought us through. So there's, there might be a way of doing it, but you always have to think as a data scientist, what can I measure and what can't I measure? And mentality is one of the things that's very, very difficult 
um, to measure. You can measure, for example, if particular players are managing to pass to each other more successfully, so they're connecting well, but then mentality maybe isn't the right word to use it. Um, Sarthak asks, uh, can I use the law of large numbers to be used to estimate the number of short and long passes in football? Yes, that's a good application of the law of large numbers. I haven't really gone into the detail, but one of the exercises I've left in the GitHub is to use the normal distribution to estimate the number of um, the number of shots in the match. Number of passes is going to be really well modeled by the normal distribution. Um, for, okay, so Tefa asked now, sort of following up on this, uh, the first 10 would be um, cup final, seven occurrences that lead. Yeah, I, I actually, so it's quite interesting in the, um, uh, in the, I'm going to talk about the 538 model. They do include that if it's the cup final, um, what, how much is on the match, um, how much, how important is this match to the teams is something that they put in. So that, that type of mentality you can definitely do. Um, we've done a project, for example, we did a project at Hammerby looking for big match players and um, players who overperform and underperform when they're playing against better and worse teams. So you can actually use that um, at, the, at the level of the players possibly to, to do. Um, could you comment on the Dixon Coles model versus a, the Dixon Coles model is Poisson regression. So um, you're right. I'm not actually, I haven't got that as a reference there, but um, the Dixon Coles model is precisely that. It's a, it's a Poisson based regression model. So Dixon Coles uses Poisson um, to work. I'll, I, <laughs> it's great that you bring up the Dixon Coles because I don't explicitly mention that paper, but it's one of the key papers using Poisson. Um, um, great. Okay, so uh, Vincent Lee says the fundamental equation of football you provided is quite interesting. Yeah, I think that's really fun. Um, I don't know how seriously it should be taken because if the games were if the games were forty five minutes or something like that, then it would be different. Great. Um, I will. I'm going to have a break now. I'll put up the slide for the break and. Um, I will be back very shortly. Okay, see you in 15 minutes.
Good. So before the break, we went into some depth about the Poisson distribution and how wonderful it is and how much it captures of football because of the inherent randomness in football. What we're going to spend the rest of the lecture on today is, is basically using that then to construct a statistical model which will allow us to test various hypotheses. Um, someone asked about the Dixon-Coles model and that was a brilliant question because I realized that I'd forgotten to give the original source of, of, of where this was used, which is the Dixon-Coles model. So I just put that in during the break, so we'll get to that very quickly. Um, then that was a normal distribution. If we were interested in another sport, almost any other sport than football and I mean, it's, it's marginal when we come from hockey, if we go from Poisson distribution up to normal distribution, if there's sufficiently number of goals. But most sports have sufficiently number, number of points in them that we use the normal distribution, but um, Poisson is what we use here. Okay, so what we can do, well, I'm gonna to come to how we do it um, over time, but one thing that we can do quite simply is before we, we start like fitting the model, Let's just assume that you think that Manchester City score two goals on average and Everton score one goal on average. This is from something which I've done. The link, link is at the bottom. I did this for a few years, a few years ago. And City were going to play Everton. And just to illustrate, again, the power of the Poisson distribution, if I... Assume that City score two goals. So the Poisson parameter for City is two and the Poisson parameter for Everton is one. Then I can actually simulate all different results. Just, it's not even simulation. It's just picking out from the equation we gave here. So we put two in for City and one in for um, Everton. Putting those in, we can actually pick out how many goals the two teams will score. And we can make a quite easily just make a graph like this. So this isn't based on even simulating anything in the sense that we run a computer simulation. It's just based on sticking the parameter two into the Poisson distribution um, for City and sticking the parameter one into the Poisson distribution for Everton and then making a, a list of the different results. So five nil is quite unlikely because the average goals is two, um, while something like two nil is much more likely and see in fact two nil is the most likely score in this case even though um two one was the average goals that we would expect from the two teams so this gives uh situations where city wins situations where everton win, um where it's a draw and situations where everton wins all directly from the Poisson distribution but what i've done there is i've actually assumed in advance i know that City score two goals on average, or I expect that from the match in order to calculate probability. What we'd like to do, what we prefer to do, is estimate that from data from previous matches. Again, if we, if we, this one is based on on estimates of data from previous matches. Um, this is something I did in Socomatics. I simulated. I took the scoring rates of clubs during 2012-13. Then I simulated what might happen in the 13-14 system um, season on the basis of that. And you can see here Manchester City did win that season, and you can um, see some of the simulations they they win. Um, here we have Liverpool second, Chelsea third. This is just a random selection of the simulations, or a sim or a selection of the simulations in order to illustrate that point. We get these types of results out of it. So we could also get based on the scoring rates from the previous season that Liverpool might have, have uh, won that season. And. These things give reasonably convincing models of what happens over an entire season. But this is what, what I wanted to emphasize. I'm, I'm going to come back to how we actually do these simulations in a bit. But um, what I want to emphasize beforehand, they, these models aren't perfect. They tend to a little bit, they underestimate the best teams. If you notice here, City won by far more points than 73. In, this, in these recent seasons, we've seen um, City and Liverpool on like 99 and 100 points and things like that. That's not going to be predicted by a Poisson model because it's always just a little bit too conservative. So they're, they're never perfect for the number of points. Um, 
and that's partly the nature of the model. This is small things that, that don't quite work with the model. Plus it's partly that it's difficult to estimate the scoring rates for the teams. So one thing we can do, for example, is we can use expected goals early in the season to simulate um, future matches. So the, these simulations, they, they kind of work. They're not very far away, but they're certainly not perfect either. And that's evidenced by the fact that the best teams slightly overperform what the model would predict. And also the worst teams tend to underperform what the model would predict. They, they sort of make things a little bit more even than we'd like them to be. Okay, to summarize, football's chaos makes it predictable. Um, goal distribution can be found. This is what I think is one of the coolest things. It, just with one parameter, you can find the whole distribution of things and you can even predict um, very reasonably the results of a match. You can predict the results of a season using those types of things. Scoreline can be predicted. Draws tend to be a bit wrong um, for different leagues. That's what bookmakers spend a lot of time adjusting for. You can simulate the league easily. Um, and what we're going to look at now is how you can find these as, as indicators of good football. Um, this simple model of Poisson goals is really difficult to beat. It's very, very difficult to beat. And you don't see people beating this, this model very often. The bookmaker's odds slightly beat this model, but really this simple model is difficult to beat. Okay, so how do we estimate the parameters? And that's the problem that was solved by Dixon and Coles, which um, was mentioned in the chat. Beautiful paper, 25 years old now, incredible. Um, where they said, okay, goals of Poisson distributed seems to be the case. What we need to do is have a model to estimate the parameters for this pass on distribution. So here they've written down the joint probability of the home team um, getting X goals, the away team getting Y goals. And the main part of it here is the Poisson distribution here that you have um, Lambda X, which is the uh, Lambda is the rate at which the home team scores mu is the rate at which the away team scores and you have two separate parameter values for both of those um, both of those teams and the equivalently you can say as as we do down here get my laser pointer out again um, as we can say down here we can say that well the the random variable which describes the scoring rate of the home team against the away team is Poisson distributed with three parameters. One is an estimate of the quality of the home team's attack. The, the um, B to J is an estimate of the away team defense. And um, this gamma parameter is the home advantage parameter. And all of these things can be estimated using Poisson regression on the data. And that's what we do, we do in the code. We try and estimate these these separate parameters. See, in this case, they're multiplicative. I think normally you would use multiplicative parameters. Um, so this thing is going to be like 1.1, for example, if a home team is particularly good in attack. B to J, a, a good away team defense is going to be 0.9, so it reduces the probability. And then the home advantage um, is going to be some particular um, value. So I think it's 1.2 or something like that, multiplying the number of goals that you're likely to score. And what we do in the code, let me just go briefly. I don't want to get stuck too much into um, the code, but I do want to give you a feeling for it. Um, if we, I need to share the screen. I want to do that. Just say overall in today's, the, the code that I've released today, um, I help you get going with this. The first one does the shot times, loads in the different things. We, we looked at that, generates the, loads in the Y Scout data, um, generates the shots, looks at all the events for the German league, for example, finds all the shots, tags them and um, sees when they occur. Um, am I going to wait for this? Yeah, there we go. 
So that, that generates the first plots that I showed you. So you can play around with that. It's also too interesting. There was a question about passes, for example. You can do something similar looking at passes would be interesting to do. That's what code nine does. Code 10 in the GitHub, um, it loads, uh, it does the Poisson distribution. So if I just put in all the code for that, I should get out. This was for the German league looks at the number of goals as a Poisson plot. Um, you can change leagues up here and look at La Liga and so on to see where you are with that. And that uses the Yscout data. All of these use the Yscout data. Now, the, the 11th one is, is different. Um, I actually wrote this code because I was kind of interested. I was very interested when Corona broke out could we, resim could we simulate what would have happened in the Premier League? There was a lot of questions about, for example, um, well, there's there a lot of questions about like what was, what was a fair decision um, for who would stay up and who would go down if you had to simulate the league or if you had to award points for the thing. And I think that basically the most fair way, it's not going to be something that any football authority is going to say that we're going to do, but the most fair way to decide the league is to use a Poisson model and simulate it into the future. And the highest probability results for the teams, that, if, if a team has the highest probability of, of winning, then that should be the one that wins the league in second and third and fourth, should basically be decided on the highest probability team in that particular position. And also for the ones that go down, I don't think anyone's ever gonna do that, but that would be one way of, um, reasonably doing it. And so I actually, um, I looked at some more recent data and Peter um, McKeever also used this data in his, in his analysis. There's this lovely data set collected by um, at footballdata.co.uk, um, collected by Yosef, um, Joseph Bookdahl, I think his second name is, brilliantly collated data set, which allows you to fit models or which tells you just the results of the matches, which is all we really need for this um, for this type of model. So if I load up that data, I get a, to be honest, when I first did this fitting of the model, I, I did it at the point when the season had been um, postponed or we didn't know what was going to happen about Corona and so on, but it gives a nice data frame full of the both the odds for the games and the number of goals that were scored and so on. And so you've got all of that. And so when I, when I did it, we actually didn't know what the rest of the season would look like. And so it was a good point to try and simulate out the rest of the season. Now, actually, we have all of the data from last season loaded into this. And we are going to use stats models again. One of my favorite um, packages for do it for doing statistical modeling. It does the more sort of traditional statistical models, the kind of things that Dixon and Cole would be doing. Load in goal model data makes a um, makes uh, this goal model data is it head. Um, actually just gives us the goals that Liverpool scored against Norwich, for example, West Ham against Man City. Simple data set of this, of this type. Then this is code. I want to emphasize that this is code I, I got originally from a very nice um, blog about predicting models using Dixon and Cole. Um, you can go in and have a, have a look at that. But they basically use the Poisson model in statistical models to fit the goals as a function of the home team, the, sorry, home advantage. This is a home one zero if um, the team's at home, the, um, the team, the opponent, and so on. And then we're going to later, so we can, we can fit this model. There we go. And once we have that, um, that model, we can actually have the coefficients for every one of the, the teams. So in this case, a coefficient, I'm going to go into this back in the lecture, but coefficient, a positive coefficient indicates a good team, a negative coefficient indicates a bad team. 
Arsenal, because it's alphabetically first in the um, in the list of teams, that's actually been picked out as the benchmark team. So what these tell you are, is a team better or worse than Arsenal? So Aston Villa are statistically worse than Arsenal. Bournemouth are statistically worse than Arsenal. Chelsea are statistically better than Arsenal. Manchester City are a lot better than Arsenal. Um, so no surprises there. We'd be surprised if it didn't come out with these types of things. That's in terms of scoring goals. And then in terms of um, conceding goals, Aston Villa concedes statistically more goals than Arsenal do and so on. And then what we can do is once we've got those rates, we can start to actually simulate matches. And that's what the rest of the code does. Um, I've found that the scoring rates of Manchester City is 2.6. Arsenal against Manchester City are expected to score 1.16. And this one, I think it's nice just to run this a few times. So this is just some matches. Well, that was a Manchester City Arsenal. That was meant to be the match that would be the first match after the um, the break. And there you go. I just ran the simulation. Came out two two. So um, that's really that should be the result. Now um, I'll do that again. Run it again. No, Manchester City lost. Oh, now they won four 0 we just keep doing 5-1, 3-1, 3-1. I'm surprised that I've got these results. Well, there you go. We've got the randomness in football. You really get an idea for these things. 4-2, 8-1. Okay, that's incredible. So um, those you, you can run these things and you get different results, but that's not really the most, um, it's not the most scientific way of predicting the results. What you need to do is simulate it lots and lots of times. And that's what the last uh, part of the code does. And it makes one of these very pretty figures, which tells you the probability of different outcomes. So the most likely outcome in all these simulations is 3-0 to Manchester City. Then um, you have 1-0. Some of these results we got for Arsenal were very unlikely based on this, but that's the feature of randomness. So this, this gives you a matrix. So this the probabilities, it's like any of the heat maps that we've done earlier, this is the probabilities of the different score lines occurring. Um, most of the things are clustered around here, about a 3-1, 2-1 type of result is the most likely, and then the less likely ones are further out here. Okay, let me go back to the um, thing. So you should definitely go in and have a play around with that code later. Problem, and that's exactly what we generated. Again, I recommend, uh, thoroughly recommend this um, blog where they go through the details of how they how they did this fit um, based on the Dixon and Coles model. But what's important here is that teams that are significantly better or worse than Arsenal, and th this is one of the things that I want to get to the um, well, get to the bottom of here because. If the coefficient is greater than, um, if the coefficient is positive, then the team is better than Arsenal. If the coefficient here is negative in this regression, the team is worse than Arsenal. But we should also look at the probability values because when we do these statistics, we actually want to find out are teams statistically better or worse than Arsenal? Now imagine from Arsenal's perspective, how they're thinking about these types of things. So, they want to be a top four team. So they can accept maybe that um, Chelsea, but no, no, they're, sorry, they can accept maybe that Manchester City and Liverpool who have been very strong recently are um, stronger than them, but they are less likely to accept, for example, that Tottenham are stronger than them or that um, Chelsea are stronger than them because they're competing for those places in the, in the top four. And this gives us some part of the answer there, which teams are statistically over last season stronger than Arsenal. And you actually find that there's just, this one should have been red, but there's just two of them. Uh, Liverpool and Manchester City, they have p-values which are lower than 0 0.05 is what you would usually use as a cutoff. So only Liverpool and Manchester City, you could say are statistically overperforming Arsenal last season. But on the other side, we only have three teams which are statistically underperforming Arsenal. And those are Crystal Palace, Norwich, and Watford. So all of the other teams 
are not indistinguishable, but they're very similar to Arsenal. And this makes it very problematic for somebody who's sitting at Arsenal deciding what they should do. They're basically statistically no different than how many teams? 14 other teams in the Premier League. They're, no, they're not statistically different than Manchester United appear to be a bit better than them, but Manchester United aren't statistically better than Arsenal. Um, Leicester did better than them, but Leicester aren't statistically better than Arsenal. So they can certainly use this to place themselves in a ranking of how well they performed last season, but they can't say, see Spurs here, that's quite interesting. Spurs aren't any different than Arsenal at all. And so they can't really use this to give any strong evidence of, of where they are or where they're going. This makes it really difficult when you're planning a football club. The fans have some expectations about something you should do this season. You should qualify for the Champions League and you can have those as a goals. But when you're actually reviewing the data, you find that you statistically aren't very different from most of the other clubs in the, um, in the league. Um, this, that was in attack. Same thing you can do in defense. I haven't illustrated the things, but again, if you look at the p-values, <laughs> Aston Villa's defense weren't statistically significant worse than Arsenal's defense last season. It's actually very few. Norwich's defense was statistically um, significantly worse than Arsenal's defense last season. And even Manchester City's defense wasn't better. So the, these give really even results. Um, and that's always a tension there, looking for these things which are really true statistical message methods that you as a statistician or a data scientist would be convinced about and what you, um, what the expectations are about being able to say that certain teams are better than others. Nice thing there is home advantage is 0.2353 goals. So I thought that was a nice, nice thing to bring in. There is still a home advantage. It seemed to disappear. There's quite a few studies looking at this, how it disappeared a little bit during the uh, indoor corona times. So you could actually measure that using this, this type of model. And I think I've actually said this, so this is, I've um, emphasized this a lot in, in what I said about the coefficients. Statistically significant differences are remarkably difficult to find in football. And that's often why we tend to concentrate on looking at the style of play metrics that we use a lot of heat maps and um, passing networks and things just to identify the style of play because these things that we can actually measure more reliably and even there we can't necessarily measure them in a statistically reliable way but we can actually measure them more reliably and get more insight to them in into them than just looking if we've won or lost football matches. It's really counterintuitive and difficult thing to understand, but um, we want to like go deeper down into our understanding because this overall, are we doing better or are we doing worse, just becomes a very difficult question to answer. Um, just now I'm working with Hammerby and we're I think seventh in the league. And when we re-simulate the table based on expected in goals, and goals, realistically, we could be anywhere between second and eighth. And this is a very difficult discussion to have, especially if you try and have it with players and coaches who are actively involved in like lifting us up from seventh to second or first, uh, to tell them, well, we could have been anywhere between second and eighth is really difficult for them to swallow. Um, and it's very difficult for fans to swallow, but that's actually what the models um, tell you with the, um, when you do look at these things properly. There is a wide range of places you can realistically expect to end up on any particular season. If the, if the data told us that we were likely, we were likely to be 15th or something, then that would be a real problem. But a span of second to eighth when we're actually seventh doesn't sound, isn't that, um, that bad. Well, it is bad, but it's not that bad. Okay, so I did one more exercise. If you go back into the um, um, go into the back into the women's football data, I last time when I presented this, I looked just at passes in my um, Poisson regression. So I just looked at this passes, and I found that passes were a statistically significant predictor of good football. And this time, in order to do it properly, I actually put in all of the teams into there. So I, do I see that there is a team 
related effect. And the p-values for none of the teams are actually statistically significant. I think um, I'm looking for the USA. No, even that. So, so actually passes turned out to be quite a good predictor. And that's one of the things when you do a regression of this type, if you're interested in a particular metric, such as number of passes, you should always correct. This is called, um, I've forgotten what it's called in, in statistics, where you have fixed effect models. So the fixed effects are the teams and the passes is the variable you're interested in. What you try to do is you remove the fixed effects. If you're interested in a style of a particular thing like passes and the, the value that passing adds, you remove the, um, the team variable because using these fixed effects variables and you see that none of them are statistically significant. So passing the ball a lot at the Women's World Cup last time, as far as we can see from the data here, was a reliable sign of playing good football. I think that's quite a, a nice result. We removed the fact that, for example, certain teams pass the ball a lot and we still get this result. So passing does correlate um, and does seem to indicate better football in terms of predicting goals. Remember, this was a Poisson Pass on regression of passes and all of these other teams onto goals. You can go back into file number eight in the GitHub and do that analysis yourself. See that. I've got some very nice studies of this, this type. So what, what can you tell? The a question came up about passing intensity. So this is another one. This is really, if you look in the academic literature compared to what you see written in well on twitter or something like that very seldom do uh, does it come up like how what passing rates the teams have so this is number of passes while in possession of balls so number of passes divided by possession time this is a study by thomas grund who's a sociologist actually and he was interested in the property of social football as a social network and he tested passing rate. I'll come back to network centralization, but let's let's concentrate on, um, yeah, let's actually start with possession because I said in an earlier um, thing that ball possession wasn't statistically significant. And so he looked at possession of the teams, he looked at intensity, which is passing rate, and he looked at centralization, which I'll come back to. And he made he created three models. The first model, has no fixed effects. So you just do a Poisson regression of goals scored as ball possession. And he finds that that is statistically significant at the 1% level. But then he says, well, what if I put in a team effect? So he was studying the Premier League. And so if he puts in the, uh, a, just like I did here for all of the teams, um, all of the teams playing in the Women's World Cup, he put all of the teams in, in the Premier League, and he said, well, if I do that, is possession still important? And then he finds out, no, there's no statistical effect of possession. And so the, basically the possession part here is that um, at this time when he was analyzing the game, it was Arsenal and Manchester United who were the best teams. They have more possession than the other teams. And once you included them as the team, the statistical effect dropped away and possession was no longer a statistically good predictor of um, success. And then the last one, he puts in both the home team and the away team. That's like I did here, home team, here, away team. And then he found that, again, possession has no effect. In fact, possession, when you account for the teams, possession, if there is any trend, it makes the teams worse than better. Um, then network intensity, this passing rate I love a lot because it, it doesn't come up a lot in, uh, in public discussions about teams. Um, I know that some teams do use this. You basically divide the number of passes by the time in possession. And he found that this was statistically significant, definitely when you don't put in the fixed effects of the teams. And to a sort of small degree here, this was statistically significant at a 5% uh, 
and a 10% level. This is something to be slightly skeptical about, but it, it does seem to be a reasonable pattern. So even accounting for the fact that teams are different, some teams are better than others, the regression indicates that passing tempo is more likely to produce good football and score more goals. So concentrating on getting your team's passing tempo up is a way to expect to score more goals. The last one he said is network centralization. I'll just tell you that he also found that two centralized networks, I'm gonna say a bit about what centralization is afterwards, but before I, I do that, let's just say that two centralized networks, that means that the ball goes too often to the same player, tend to produce worse football. So the more distributed your game is, the better, um, the more likely you are to succeed. And he found this actually at 5%, 5% level. It's a very nice paper. And this is how you want to do it. If you've got your metric, you believe will predict good football in a particular way. You have to do this second, well, you have to do all three regressions, but you in particular have to do this last regression where you take into account team quality, which is sort of taking into account the quality of the players. Um, I said centralized versus decentralized. I wrote a, a Medium article, which you can have a look at about this. Um, one thing that could be noticed in um, the first, this was an Ibrahimovic, it wasn't Pogba's first season, but Manchester United in this season, what was it, three, four seasons ago? Um, yeah, four, if you count this, this season. Their passing networks, so this thickness of this, like you've seen in some of the other lectures, thickness of this is how often team players pass to each other. Their passing networks were very, very focused on Pogba. Nearly all the balls uh, went through Pogba up to Rooney and Ibrahimovic was also going through Pogba. And their results, though this one they happened to win, their results weren't quite, quite as good as Liverpool, who have a much more decentralized style of play. And even if you look at Manchester City, they'll have more links between them but they have a very decentralized style of, fo of football. And these are, these are anecdotal pieces of information, but the Grun study shows that that's something to start looking for. If you can measure network centralization, which you can, um, I think some of the other talks have detailed how you do that. You measure the network centralization and you see, is your team playing too centralized? And if so, are they playing through a particular player? And there is a statistical reason to believe that you might have problems if you have that too centralized style of play. Good. Wow. Um, ranking models. I what I've got here that's things. Yeah. I think what do I want to do here? I want I certainly want to take questions. So if you are um, writing questions into the um, into the chat, I can answer them before I, I go on to ranking models. Oh, there's lots of questions. Oh yeah, some, some people are saying, all right, okay, that's to do practical things with uploading. Um, One question here, is anyone else using this information to help themselves? Do not use this information to, I'll just um, really emphasize this point. I have not said anything here which will allow you to make money gambling. You need to work a lot harder if you're going to make money gambling. I haven't, there's a, uh, you have to actually, there's a whole bit on logistic regression of odds and so on, which you, which I've missed out here deliberately in this course. You will not get rich gambling using any of the models I've talked about today. And so I better do this last part of the course because I'm going to point that out. Um, some things about 10 and 10 and 11 can be seen as a limitation. Um, yeah, there's a question about comparing to another team than Arsenal. I'm a bit, yeah, I'm not quite sure I can do that directly, or I don't want to say precisely how you would do it, but basically those coefficients that you see in those tables, um, if I look at the coefficients in the tables, they basically give the rankings of the teams. Of course, they're very correlated with where you end up in the table, um, but you can actually, I've done it 
statistically to Arsenal, but the coefficients there give the relative rankings of the team. So you see Norwich is worse relative um, to Bournemouth. I don't know technically exactly how you do that, but um, there must be some way. Um, are you saying that game state isn't a thing? I'm not sure I'm saying that game state isn't a thing. I think it's not as important a thing um, for the purposes that we're doing it. Again, it relates to the gambling question. If you're doing gambling, then you need to you need to account for game state in these types of models. But for most of the stuff that you're interested, if we're interested, what we're interested in the course is producing better football. What you're you don't want to start putting too much game state things in in the first model. Um, I don't want to give a definitive answer of that because I'm not an expert, but you can get a long way without without putting the game state. Um, are clubs interested in the results of models like this, or is there more, more for stand? Yeah, so clubs are interested in models like this. So for example, there's a company called 21st Club, and the types of models I'm talking about just now, they rely heavily on their, their business to do. So what they do is they encourage clubs to be realistic. So the type of discussion I went into a little bit about becoming second and seventh and so on, they try and they go in and they work with clubs like Southampton, for example, and say, well, what's your goal? Um, and here's what we think is a realistic goal for you and where you should be. And that becomes it becomes a much more balanced discussion, especially at the board level. And the board becomes more realistic about both about like the probability of going down, for example, for Southampton, you might say. Fans apparently were very enthusiastic about Southampton this season, but Southampton actually always need to consider the probability of going down. And they have to realize that there is always that 3% chance that Southampton will go down independent of what they do. And that's really difficult to take on board, but you want to try and get the board of clubs to understand those types of things. Um, is the Dixon Coles formula the one you used in your book to compare betting strategies? Um, sort of, yes. In one of the betting strategies, so one of the betting strategies I used passing rate and expected goals. I did a Dixon and Coles uh, Poisson regression to find the coefficients of um, of those types of things. Maybe I will do a gambling if you want to. Now I'm just selling my my new book, but I have a I, the, my new book. The Ten Equations starts with a whole bit on gambling and the equations you need to do gambling. It doesn't tell you all the answers, but it's a starting point for those types of things and the information that you need. Um, so my disclaimer is nothing in this in this talk. Uh, well, this talk might be the start of producing a gambling model, but a lot more is needed. Good. So then, then I think it's good because a lot of the questions are actually about um, limitations. So I think it's perfect that I, I finish up um, with a couple of things about ranking models. Um, this is my own work, so I think that it's really for reference to have a look at later. So ELO models, I'm not really going to go into the details of what they are because I'm going to say that they don't really work for the purposes that we're interested in. The ELO model is a model which was mainly used for chess when you have head-to-head -head games between chess players. You get points for a win um, and you lose points for a loss, but that point exchange depends on the level of your opponents. So if a very good team loses against a very poor team, they give the um, other team more points than if a, um, a good team loses against another very good team then they just exchange a small number of points. And that's a nice website, uh, clabello.com, which uses ELO models to describe football. So my problem with that type of model is that it has no grounding in the randomness argument that I brought up at the start. It's just an, a sort of exchange of points. It has no grounding in what actual football is and scoring goals and conceding goals. It's not really grounded in that. And I think you're going to do better with models which are grounded in, um, in that kind of thing. So I don't, I think it's fun and interesting with the ELO models. Sometimes it's, it's nice to look up, especially for interleague comparisons, 
um, where you might rank the teams, but I'm not sure that it's it's really the best the the best type of modeling. And that's why I'm I'm not going into it. We might we might have a video later which does explain how you do it, um, but I'm not a big fan. The the 538 Global Club Soccer Rankings that's got better and better over the years. It started off as an ELO ranking type of system, but they've really fine tuned it and done some very interesting stuff to make it perform better. Don't think it beats the bookmakers odds, but they have put in a lot of work. And I, I basically would recommend that you look into the method methodology there um, to work it, but they do to um, use it, but they do all of this simulating the league trying to find out the probability that the team will qualify for the Champions League, that they'll win the Premier League. Interesting to see Manchester City up there as 57%. Um, so they're really trying to make predictions of the future. Just a little bit about how it works, what they do. Again, you can read all of this from their webpage. What they do is they do a lot to look at the market value. So they, they have a base model, which is the market value of the team. So every year they've got the, the soccer SPI, this is the global soccer ranking rating of the team. They do a regression here. They do a linear regression of the total value of the team, the monetary value of the each of the players, sorry, the, yeah, the, each of the players, total them up, give the um, total value there. And um, they do a regression there to try and predict in the future how well they'll do. So they predict their postseason ranking based on their, their market value. Then they combine that. This is just a random parameter. I imagine that they tuned up and chosen for some reason. One third of it is the transfer market. Two thirds of it is how they were rated at the end of last season. And then that gives them a pre-season rating. So this, you would call this the prior um, for their model. It's the, what you expect before the season started. It takes the rankings from last season and it throws in something to do with the market value of the players. So this is a kind of wisdom of the crowds type of thing. And then they get a pre-season rating of each team. Then they use goals, shot-based expected goals and non-shot expected goals. So the expected goals we've talked about, non-shot is basically how often the team gets into the box and are in near shooting positions. And it's a model I haven't actually looked at this, of course, but it's an interesting model. You try to say how often when you get into a particular position, um, is it likely to be a goal, whether there is a shot or, or not. And you can fit, um, well, goals is simple, but you can fit an expected, a shot-based expected goals as we've done in previous lectures. You can also look at this non-shot, which is just based on if, if there was a shot or not, you get into that position, how likely you were to score. And then for every match, you look at the adjusted goals, um, you look at the shot-based expected goals, and you look at the non-shot expected goals, and you use that to update the rankings of the players. And it was quite cool to see they use exactly this. I showed this heat map of the results. I've no idea why they also used Everton versus Manchester City in their, their example, but apparently it's a popular example to, to use. This one is Liverpool versus Brighton. Most likely result 2-0 to Liverpool but a whole range of different results that they can they can produce there. Then they simulate the league. Okay. I think I feel that when I'm when, while I'm talking, I'm going on and on and on about the limitations of these models. <laughs> Even though I'm presenting how you should use the models, I'm I'm basically talking through the limitations of them. Um, this is some of the stuff that I wrote in Socomatics. This is a this is, for example, so pre-season predictions, you see a lot of these now. You have three different types. You have um, the ones based on models, like the 538 model. You often read stories before there's a big world championship. You always hear about how Price Waterhouse Cooper or some large consultancy firm have predicted what's going to happen in the World Cup. And there's always a story in the Daily Telegraph about that. Um, and, and yeah, we've got the 538 model. So you have models, you have the experts who, they're pundits who are saying um, what's going to happen. And then you can actually compare this, just what is typically, what typically happens in this championship. So 
um, one model you can compare these experts and the models to. A simple model is just to say, well, where you finished last year is where you will finish next year. So Liverpool will finish first in the, in the uh, Premier League, Manchester City will finish second and so on down the, down the table. And what I did is I compared the average position error for pundits who'd actually rank teams. The, these are all, all the experts are um, put along here compared to the position the season before. And you see there's only one person who overperformed to any large degree. This was for 2014-15. For 2013-15, people did, there was a few people who did overperform a little bit. I noticed this guy, this guy in particular, he overperformed in these, in these seasons, but they didn't really overperform if you just took the average error over these seasons. So they were, all the experts were a little bit lucky for some, some reason. They tend to, the experts seem to, I looked into this in more detail in this blog. I just put it up on Medium if you want to have a look at it. Um, this year, this was the year that Leicester won. If you'd just written, uh, I mean, Leicester, Leicester won, so they had a very unexpected um, position. But if you just wrote down, everybody's going to follow exactly the same Thing as they did the previous season, you would have done better than all of the experts put together. So these experts who are giving their punditry very seldom do better than just guessing what happened in the previous uh, model, uh, previous year. And then even the models as well. So even models based on the Poisson distribution, um, uh, based on the rankings, based on ELO rankings, I haven't tested the 538 model, but it wouldn't surprise me if this was true as well. They don't tend to over overperform what happened in the previous previous year. And this is how much money you would lose if you use the ELO. If you just bet it at random, you'd lose this much money. If you use the ELO club, um, the Euro club index, you would lose this much money. So really no difference um, there either. And you see this over and over again, the Euro club index doesn't beat the betting markets. Oh, I said I wouldn't talk about betting, but I did put a little bit in. I mean, Joseph Bookdahl, who who um, who runs the football data, he's written a book, really just going home on this this analysis, time and time and time again, that you can't beat beat the bookmakers. The bookmakers' odds are the sort of culmination of the wisdom of the crowds. Um, so they are not likely to book, then they just don't beat the bookmakers. So the bookmakers odds just beat pretty much all of these types of models. Um, he does have a strategy, so now, now I feel like I'm recommending, he does have a strategy which is based on sometimes the bookmakers odds become unbalanced. And then if you're very patient, you can find those types of things. So this is his strategy that he outlines in the book, which has made some kind of gain over the last five years. You can look on the web page for how that works. But it's a very boring strategy of finding when the favorites are mispriced. And the favorites are mispriced now and again by certain bookmakers who aren't doing their job properly. If you're very quick and you have lots of accounts, you can go in there and exploit that tendency. But for the most part, you're not going to win money um, booking uh, against the bookmakers because they know better what they're doing than you, plus they then have some edge between one and 5% over you. Um, so you need a lot more before you're going to get there. Okay, summarizing simulations and prediction. Um, I'm just gonna leave it at that because I've gone over time and I don't like to go over time. And so I will say thank you for today. Um, I'll, I think I, I'll just have a quick look at these questions and and answer them for um, anyone who does want to stick around. But otherwise, I've finished the main, uh, main part of this talk. And I will see those of you um, in the course on Thursday. And I'll also go into the Slack group and answer any questions. In the Slack group, I've made a new one for the, the projects. Um, anyway, now I'm, just, now I'm just babbling. I will have a quick look at these questions and see what what you've got here
Yeah, there's a question, what are the adjusted goals? Actually, I don't know what the adjusted goals are. I have to go and um, uh, look in it. Do you prefer 538's ranking over the Euro Club Index? Yes, I do. I think I read, I actually read about that yesterday and today, and I'm very impressed with their new ranking system. Just how they've built it up, uh, the statistical steps they've uh, made. I haven't looked, I haven't looked to see if it beats the odds and things like that probably doesn't, but it's more systematically created. It uses more of the Poisson regression approach that we've talked about today. Um, and uh, it, it works, yeah. So I, I think I do prefer it more than the Euro Club Index. Uh, could someone answer, Robert, how you get into the Slack group? You sent me an email, Robert, I've answered it, and I told you that you should look on the front web page to get into the Slack group. If you look on the web page of the course, you'll find details of how to get into the Slack group. Good. OK, great. Thank you all for today. And I will see you um, see you for a lecture next week and for tutorials on Thursday. Cool. Bye bye.